Thank you very much. Excellent. So yeah, so the topic is digitizing project handovers on a national schools program. Um, for those of you who don't know about SFT, uh, SFT is um, an independent company that's publicly funded by the Scottish Government. We work at arm's length with both private and public sector bodies to create new infrastructure in Scotland that's world class for essentially um, the citizens and to bring value and benefits to the, the public purse. Um, within SFT, there's you know about 70, 80 people work there, and the colleagues cover a lots of different topic uh, uh, niches and uh, such as net zero, place making, asset strategy, delivering 4G and 5G networks all over Scotland, um, improving project and construction delivery, and inf infrastructure technology is where I, I'm sort of based. So within uh, 2017, uh, SFT support the Scottish Government to develop the BIM mandate for Scotland and that was delivered through a Scottish public procurement note which mandated the use of um, BIM on projects over 2 million and uh, that anybody that would use the um, public finance manual would have to initially grade their projects at the start and depending on certain criteria those projects would either fall within what was then a BIM 1 or BIM level 2 set of requirements um, there was a return on investment resource made available for clients to be able to triage their projects to create some return on investment and benefits realization um, report that can be used to um, obviously support the business case. And then there was a portal developed which was packed full of case studies, uh, checklists, videos aligned to the REBA stages where clients and also industry, industry could go in and understand what should be done at key stages. So it was very much setting up that sort of bedrock um, to support BIM on, on a project. And as we all know, um, BIM level two, as it was then, um, you know, there was lots of BIM projects delivered. Um, and what we have discovered is obviously, you know, there was lots of benefits that were achieved maybe through a BIM process that were just predominantly benefits for contractors and maybe some of the del delivery chain. But for clients at Handover, we, we repeatedly seen this sort of BIM cliff or information cliff at the end of projects where all the as constructed information, all the asset information that was locked into the models just basically dropped off in its digital format and locked away um, where nobody had just could see it in the light of day. Um, and in most cases that information was also locked away with the paper O&Ms. Um, there was not much upfront thinking and strategy around how that information could evolve and actually be used to create um, you know, the means to be able to operate that building across the whole life cycle. And by virtue of that, it's very difficult then without that, that um, digital or asset information to be able to understand how that building is performing. Is it compliant? Is it achieving the quality and maintaining the quality that it was designed and constructed for? Is it safe? And, and also more importantly, can we monitor and measure the energy performance of it? So a big industry issue and a problem that we have tried to tackle, you know, at, at sort of to support clients to be able to specify what they need. Um, and so part of that journey initially led us to develop a resource, um, which is still ongoing and, and continues to evolve, called the Standard Information Management Plan Resource. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit more detail about it in, 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 in the presentation. Um, but essentially there's two workbooks that's aligned to ISO 19650. The Project Information Requirements Workbook is focused on supporting clients to set out what their standard is what they need from the information. Very simple things, but very important things such as space naming, asset naming, um, how information is going to be shared at handover. And then the other workbook, which is the asset register workbook, really goes deep into being able to prescribe at the outset what information is needed for handover. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a second. So the resource is live. It's been rolled out on a two billion pound schools program across Scotland. Local authorities are also using it on um, their wider capital programs that are non-educational. So about 54 projects, 23 local authorities, and around one and a half billion pounds of projects. But the resource has been developed with industry support through collaboration, and it continues to evolve with a version three um, due out later in the year, which starts to automate some of the checking of, of the data and, and information that's been produced by the, the delivery chain. And fundamentally, this is all about 
supporting clients at the start of a project who have got set deliverables, set outcomes, to be able to ask for right information at a high level and to cascade that out down through the supply chain. Um, and the supply chain responds, creates their own information, feeds that back, and ultimately, at the end, there's outcomes associated with that. Um, so for example, you know, on the left is some of the work we've done with colleagues and external bodies around these particular themes. Um, and on the right are outcomes with, in, in the boxes there, are some of the, the strong focus areas that we have, we have, we have set out to, to try and standardize. A couple of quick examples of some of the, the quick wins. We've worked with uh, building standards in Scotland. They have a procedural handbook that's been out you know, uh, for a number of years. But within that, there was a, just a, a simple table of information deliverables that's needed for every project in Scotland to deliver, uh, to, to be submitted for completion certificate. Uh, and what we did, we worked with uh, Scottish Building Standards and Uniclass to codify those using project management, the table and codes. And um, Sarah Delaney and, and Uniclass was very helpful in trying to generate new codes to, that would work for the whole of industry, but in Scotland, to be able to standardize that, that ask. And what we can do now is we can have that as a set of information requirements for that particular outcome, and we can drop that into the information management plan at the start of all projects. So that it sort of saves time, repeated effort on the client side to, to, to have to try and specify that. Again, um, working with colleagues around construction quality, net zero, where we have produced initiatives and standards, we've done the same. And we last year completed a piece of work with the Passive House Institute. A lot of the new schools in Scotland are going down like a Passive House route. Um, we worked with the Passive House Institute to standardize and codify the information deliverables at each REBA stage that has went on to become part of the, uh, the REBA plan of work overlay. But more importantly, as I said, those, the focus of our work was very much driven by these, these reports. And without getting into the detail, you know, these reports have identified all the sort of safety and quality issues in our buildings, and some of the failures, but you know, they, they do identify that poor information, non-digital ways of delivering information are the root causes of, of not being able to, one, understand how the building is, and if it goes wrong, what the problems were and who was responsible. And that has also been echoed through our research with industry. The, the four conversation bubbles on the screen, you know, we hear repeatedly from contractors, clients, operators around the issues that they're facing, that they're not getting correct, accurate, misinformation at handover, but contractors saying the reason for that is clients aren't specifying what they need. So we, we needed to, to try and support both sides, um, both at the client side and industry as part of our solution. And then also on the operator side, ultimately, as mentioned by you, Dara, bringing them to the table or somebody before in the earlier session, they're ultimately the people who are going to be accessing information and, and making sure that they understand it and get to it quickly um, and make use of it. So we formed a, um, a cross sort of sector information working group made up of pr predominantly clients and contractors. Uh, we brought in some PMs, FM operators, and so forth. And it was to drive that. Um, the resource through industry collaboration and, and, and knowing, knowing what the real pain barriers are. And these are the sort of what surfaced was you know, really obvious but clear direction and, and requirements that were set out. So clients needed to be able to specify what they needed at the start, not starting from scratch but having a baseline to work off and along with the operators to be able to access that information but also contractors need to be able to know early what they have to deliver so they can cascade those requirements down the supply chain um, at the outset, get appointments in place, make sure if there's any skills or up training required that that can be dealt with, but also have the means to be able to check the model um, at key stages. So one of the, the main issues that contractors were facing at REBA stage three, they were getting models from designers that weren't set up properly, really poor quality, um, you know, no classification, no asset data, no product information, um, and ultimately that created risk for the contractor in terms of what they were, had to, to move forward with. So just quickly to dive into what the version three is of the information management plan. As mentioned on the left in the green area, it's the project information requirements aligned to the ISO. We tackled the asset naming and the space naming as part of that. Um, in the bottom, 
template, we've got the client folder set up. Now, this was critical to make sure that there's a consistent back-end approach to delivering information from the contractor to the teach local authority. Um, but we need to keep that simple. It can't be, a, it can't be something that's AI-driven or data-driven. It's something that's really practical and it can be used by the local authorities who really have low skills, low technology, and, and no budget um, to, to, to receive and manage information. And I guess the, the, the deep dive was into the asset register. And there, as you can see on the, the multicolored box on the right, there's eight tabs with that. And those eight tabs follow the sequence of construction or design and construction delivery. And in the yellow are the critical parts that the clients need to get involved with at the start. So they look at the baseline O&M manual that's in there. They would sit with the asset manager and the information manager and refine and calibrate their, those requirements along with any asset data that's needed, Kobe or whatever, for, for to go into a CAFM. And also, they were to review, review a, 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 um, a grading criteria, which we as a group established to be able to grade our assets according to their level of criticality. And by virtue of that, that grading, we can have pre-assigned information requirements set up as default. I'm going to touch on that again in a second. And also, the means to quality check the data, the product data in the models, the key stages and to assign the right person or the right party to that, whether they're the designer, um, supplier, or installer, so that information can be fed up through that supply chain in line with the, you know, the construction delivery process. And at the end, what the workbook does, it, it automates in tab seven a, a sort of a, a matrix of the live assets that are in the model, those of which, which are maintainable, the grades, which give the, the default or calibrated information and deliverables, um, who's responsible and when, and that can be used by the contractor to track the delivery. That live as constructed um, asset register at the end then is used to generate a maintenance calendar, um, and that is then you know effective as the as built essentially, uh, and the maintenance calendar creates uh, um, time frequencies against condition surveys. Uh, statutory compliance checks and any PPM manufacturer requirements for those maintainable assets. So just just quickly and uh, a bit of a dive into the the ins and outs of it. The, the resource is actually Excel, but it's it's used we use Power Query and um, we can import other tables to to do the checking. Um, we felt that we needed to keep it in Excel because uh, we knew that it was going to evolve as we get industry feedback and make it work. We can't, there's no point building a, a shiny brand new platform that doesn't work and give everyone within that working group the outcomes they need. So you can see from the, um, the, the table, it's maybe a bit blurred, but it's structured according to the project management table, Uniclass, there's key headings. Um, and a, a closer look into one section, for example, testing information, it can go more granular. You can get that system requirements in terms of certification, reports. Um, we've mapped it to the systems the key party responsible for delivering that information, um, and also the means for the client to identify whether there needs, needs to be training um, or, um, you know, or, or guidance to how to operate that uh, post handover. So interestingly around the asset grading, um, the, the quandary which we faced as a group was if we have 400 assets at the start, we know probably about 70 or 80 of those, 80 percent of those are going to be used consistently on school projects. <clears throat> but how do, how do we, you know, we spent half a morning trying to work out what information we would need, need for five of them. And we realized if there's 400, it's going to take forever. And how are we going to keep this up to date? So we, th we sort of cracked the nut by coming up with a grading criteria. Critical being the most critical assets. If one goes down, it has an impact on the performance of the building. You might have to evacuate it to something more mundane like a fabric panel on a building. But by being able to grade it, you can then predefine what documentation and data requirements you need for handover, and then slice that up into who needs to deliver it when, so the designers, suppliers, and installers. And within the workbook, this is you can calibrate this live. The client and the asset team can either go more or less to, for each asset type. So if it was obviously less critical data, it would go more red. You know, it's, sort of, it's, it's very flexible. And this is the, the master asset list, sort of the database. We have uh, created um, unique asset codes against them, graded them, as you can see, the discipline, and then mapped it to the systems. They're also mapped to IFC, 
so the designers uh, can quickly, you know, using what with working with um, our industry experts, we were able to create a, the classification mapping file that goes within Revit. So when a designer assigns a product classification to an element in the model, it automatically uh, maps all the other criteria into, into it as well. So that sort of ticks the box for the contractors in terms of the, getting that quality at that earlier stage. I won't go into each of these in detail, but here's a summary of those really sort of high level critical tasks for each of those parties. And on, you know, quite simply, as we all know, it's about clients really um, getting involved at the start with the asset team. On the schools program, there's a requirement that they appoint their own information manager to support that, that it's not too late you know, in the day when the contractor has their own information manager, but the clients don't know how to check that information or set it up. So that's a, a critical thing which we've done. Um, and yeah, really getting that, those requirements refined for the project or for their digital estate for the designers, use the resources to keep that quality intact and keep that live um, asset list or product list up to date and checking it within, within the workbook. And the contractors to carry that on to assign those products to the downer supply chain, to the suppliers, or if, this, if there's installers separate to that. And, and to keep that insurance going, to keep that live um, asset list right through to, to handover into operations. So where are we? Um, so there's five schools are being delivered this year, uh, six next year, and then a big ramp up to 17. Um, so my role is really sort of deep in the trenches, working with the various projects, the contractors, clients, and understanding what are the issues to get this all information transferred and then feed, fed back into the program and to, to the other stakeholders. But what we've discovered is because there's so many local authorities, there's not one handover solution that's gonna work for them all. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, this slide here sort of gives you an overview of that sort of static back end, that non-negotiable handover, where on the left you've got all those manuals and, and, and templates within the information management plan, the plethora of different types of information that you're going to get at handover, and how that should be structured using that information container or folder structure that's a, structured to the PM codes, delivered to the client, linked to the document register and linked to the asset register. The client then have a, their own front end to be able to access that. And what we found, there's four variants currently. Many clients don't have their own CDE, have no, as I said before, have no, no budget, uh, don't even manage their own paper ONMs at the moment. So um, some of the first early projects are transferring information to a SharePoint setup where um, there's an interactive PDF has been designed to map to the folders. So if you go through the building user manual, you can click on it and bring it to the folder within that environment. Um, or if you need some health and safety information, they're as constructed. Scenario B is the same back end setup, but with a SharePoint Airtable, really simple um, interface that can be used internally within a local authority and their internal building management team. And that's a piece of pilot work we we're just shortly completing with um, one local authority with the view we can almost app base that and, and that can be transferred and put onto other local authority tenancies. Other local authorities have their own CDs and CAFMs in place. So again, it's same back end goes on to that, the same folder structure and they access it that way. And lastly, third party proprietary O&M um, products that are out on the market. We're seeing some of that um, being delivered, but we've worked closely with them to make sure that their back-end folder structure matches ours as delivered by the contractor. So if the client want to move to a different platform or need to go to SharePoint at a later stage, they can port that out um, as well. So they've got that flexibility and no lock-in. So just to conclude, um, some lessons learned, as I've touched on already, um, without the client input at the start um, and knowing what they need to ask for. Um, it's game over really in terms of being able to get that information you need to hand over. We, you need to have the operator at the table. Um, and you know, what we have done is develop a good strong starting point um, to sort of fast track that, that process that they need to go through. Um, and, and obviously the, what we're trying to do as well within SFT is trying to reduce the amount of information that's being delivered. Do you really need that? And just get it right down to the baseline to, to minimize the requirements for the supply chain. Space and asset naming. 
I mean, it's one of those things is always left, left to the last minute. And at that stage, it's too late. All your design and construction information is out of sync with your Kobe information and your as, as constructed. And, and it's, it, you can't connect it um, within the ONMs. The asset strategy needs to have uh, an afterlife. Once that ONM is handed over, who's going to keep it up to date? How is it going to be kept up to date? And, and, and enforce the reasons why that needs to be done, such as condor, condition survey reporting, energy monitoring, and so forth. And the last thing, and we continue to work closely with the operators who are going to use this, is that they don't use the models. They're, they're, they're people who are driving around in vans with paper copies. They just want to have an iPad, get to something within three clicks. The model is not for them at the moment. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just not there. Um, but it is available. You know, somebody in house can reference it if they need to know a height, what ladder needs to go with that for that task, and so forth. So yeah, just to conclude, um, that it's 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 a fundamental thing to get handover. It's it's it's, it's an issue in our industry. It's not being done properly. It's not being done consistently. And without that, whether you're talking about smart buildings, digital twins, or whatever, if you don't have that bedrock of handover information at the point of when that building becomes operational, um, I like to call it, instead of a soft landing, a strong liftoff. Having everything in place to actually, at the go point, um, if that's not there, you won't be able to measure and monitor your, your building effectively. So the work continues. Um, we, we you know, be happy to come back next year and show you where we are on the journey. So thanks for your time.